Chapter 12 Entertainment and Communications from Milton Berle to the iPhone Mr. Public views that television set in his home as a 20th century electronic monster that can transport him to the ball game, to Washington, D.C., to the atomic blast in Nevada, and do it now. The viewer is inclined to accept it as his window to the world, as his reporter on what is happening now simultaneously. The miracle of television is actually man's ability to see at a distance while the event is happening. Gary Simpson, NBC Television Director, 1955 Introduction Following the so-called age of mass communication from 1870 to 1940, in which Americans benefited from an explosion of communications innovations, there occurred another dramatic shift in the way Americans consumed entertainment and information. Unlike the multiplicity of communications technologies of the previous 70 years, the post-1940 world of information and entertainment was dominated by a single behemoth, television. Though the early roots of television dated back well before 1940, commercial television did not begin until after World War II. With great rapidity, however, the advent of television would shift the American way of life to center on the home, and yet, thanks to TV's grasp on popular attention and the dominance of the major networks, managed to maintain a highly public, communal character. With unprecedented speed, Television entered the American living room and provided a window to the world that previously had been a distant dream. Television did not arrive in a vacuum, for its ability to cater to audience demands in large part owed to existing broadcast structures and practices that had been pioneered by radio. Indeed, many of television's earliest stars came from the radio world, as did much of its funding. Even so, rumors of the death of radio were, as the saying goes, greatly exaggerated. Though radio quickly lost its previously dominant hold on national audiences, it survived and thrived by filling in the cracks that television could not, adapting its programming to become local and personalized. Though families no longer gathered together around the radio as a central source of entertainment, it had become a reliable personal companion, particularly on commuting and shopping trips in the car. Motion pictures were more greatly affected by TV. After World War II, weekly cinema attendance plummeted as people chose instead to watch TV from the comfort and convenience of their own homes. Beyond the initial investment in the television set, a family did not need to pay for transportation or tickets when they could make use of their television set for free. The popularity of motion picture stars was eclipsed by that of television characters, such as Lucille Ball, who seemed to become another member of the family, or Milton Berle of Texaco Star Theater, soon dubbed Uncle Milty. Yet, like radio, the old medium of the motion picture proved to be adaptable. Though weekly movie admissions fell from 60% to 20% of the population, see figure 6-5, they did not fall to zero. After the arrival of cable television in the 1980s, the new medium increasingly relied on the film industry for programming. Just as the VCR and DVD would later become unexpected boons for the movie business, television proved to be a cash cow for Hollywood and did little to reduce the importance of the feature film in popular culture. Far from disappearing, the cultural currency of the motion picture changed from a single receiving location, the movie theater, to multiple access points, including television and, later, personal computers and smartphones. In the meantime, the audience experience of television continued to improve. As screens increased in size and gained higher definition, prices fell. By the mid-1970s, the majority of Americans were watching their favorite programs in color. The invention and expansion of cable television provided far greater consumer choice, as well as facilitating a more reliable high-quality color picture. Later on, the invention of the VCR followed by the DVR 
allowed people to watch their favorite programs on their own schedule, bringing new levels of time-shifting control to the viewer. The evolution of music listening proceeded, albeit at a slower rate than television. For much of the period after 1940, the phonograph record continued to dominate, although innovations in recording technology produced a higher quality listening experience. The shellac record and record changer were replaced by vinyl long-playing records providing stereophonic sound. More significant changes in recording quality, accessibility, and convenience arrived with the cassette tape, and later, the compact disc. Soon the CD would eliminate many of the imperfections of sound recording, while further extending playing time. By the end of the 20th century, despite the apparent similarity of its disc shape, the phonograph of the 1940s and 1950s had been almost completely supplanted by CD technology. Interpersonal communication also experienced significant change, first in the sharp reduction in the price of long-distance calls. The arrival of the mobile phone in the 1980s brought a new element of immediacy, in recent years becoming cost-effective enough to surpass the home landline telephone as the central nexus of personal communication. During this time, the cell phone has become a new form of multimedia, with the smartphone allowing users to search the web, send texts and emails, listen to music, and watch movies, in addition to the primary function of making calls, all while on the go. Just as interpersonal communications have become more instantaneous, so too has the transmission of news. Starting with radio during World War II, and later adapted to TV, on-site live reporting was a fairly novel practice in 1940. Instant transmission contributed to the long, slow decline of the print newspaper, further hastened by cable news channels such as CNN and by news obtained directly from the Internet. At the same time, television news greatly improved on the primitive week-old newsreels of 1930s and 1940s movie houses. The continuing rapid evolution of entertainment and communication throughout the era since 1940 provides a contrast to the previous two chapters. Quality and quantity improvements in food and clothing consumption, as discussed in Chapter 10, were negligible and there was a distinct slowing of progress in equipment of housing units and in the quality of household appliances after 1970. Likewise, in Chapter 11, we learned that 1970 marked a dividing line in the development of the nation's highway system and in the quality of the commercial air travel experience. No such slowing after 1970 occurs in this chapter. If anything, the arrival of smartphones and social media in the past decade constitutes an acceleration rather than a slowing of progress. The Early Years of Television Although television's golden age did not occur until the 1950s, the origins of TV's technological breakthrough took place long before that. In the 1870s, Sir William Crookes, among others, helped develop the cathode ray tube which would become the foundation for transmitting television images, although television experimenters did not recognize this until the end of the 19th century. Previously, experimenters had tried to transmit images with mechanical devices. But in 1897, Carl Ferdinand Brown created the cathode ray oscilloscope, which exposed electronic signals to visual observation. Boris Rossing in St. Petersburg expanded on this technology ten years later, achieving weak images on a photoelectric cell connected to an altered brown tube. In the following decades, other scientists continued to modify Brown and Rossing's innovations, but the biggest contributions would come from two men in the 1920s and 1930s. One was Vladimir Zworykin, an immigrant from Russia now working for American corporate giants to develop a camera tube that would solve the missing link in transmitting a television image. The other was Philo T. Farnsworth, a young man from Rigby, Idaho, who worked independently of the large companies, establishing his own laboratory in San Francisco. 
Swarikin first worked for Westinghouse, where he developed the iconoscope, which could increase the light sensitivity of the electronic camera, thus improving the image detail. In 1928, the demonstration of this device that could transmit a photoelectric television image immediately drew attention, not least from David Sarnoff, the vice president and general manager of RCA, who offered Zworykin additional research funding. Sarnoff extended support for television research even farther when RCA took control of the radio research operations of GE and Westinghouse in 1930. Meanwhile, Farnsworth, without the copious financial backing of a corporation such as Westinghouse or RCA, was busy developing his own version of the tube. Though he may not have had an extensive technical education equal to Zworykin's, Farnsworth had been interested in the idea of television since he was 15 years old. Studying photoelectricity and the cathode ray tube from his Idaho home, Farnsworth's accomplishments between 1926 and 1938, at a cost of $1 million compared to the $9 million spent by RCA, were integral contributions to television's move toward commercialization. Farnsworth's independent innovations did not go unnoticed by the big corporations. RCA caught off guard when Farnsworth applied for an electronic television patent in 1930 quickly filed a patent interference suit against him. The courts, however, sided with Farnsworth, and by August, the 24-year-old had his television patent. This would not be the last conflict between Farnsworth and RCA, and the independent inventor won a majority of the numerous patent proceedings. With the innovations of Zworykin and Farnsworth having brought television standards to a level where it could start being marketed commercially, Sarnoff took decisive action forever to link his name and his nascent national broadcasting company with the arrival of the new medium. In April 1939, at the New York World's Fair in Flushing Meadows, in front of reporters and the cameras of NBC, Sarnoff declared, It is with a feeling of humbleness that I come to this moment of announcing the birth in this country of a new art so important in its implications that it is bound to affect all society. It is an art which shines like a torch of hope in a troubled world. It is a creative force which we must learn to utilize for the benefit of all mankind. At this point, broadcasting was still only experimental. On July 1st, 1941, however, the FCC finally approved commercial standards and the CBS and NBC New York stations became WCBW and WNBT, the first two commercial television channels. Although televisions were still a rarity and were mainly limited to local broadcasting in New York and a few other metropolitan areas, prime airtime costing about a tenth the radio rate, modern television had nonetheless begun. Only five months later, though, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the United States' subsequent entrance into World War II would delay television's rise to prominence and give radio five more years in the sun. World War II and the Last Hurrah of the Old Media In May 1942, in order to direct all available resources to the war effort, the War Production Board prohibited further building of television stations. NBC and CBS quickly cut TV broadcasting, a hiatus that would last until the summer of 1944. Meanwhile, radio entered the peak of its influence as the essential conveyor of war news to a population hungry for every shred of news about the evolution of combat. Radio had such universal reach that 62 million Americans, nearly half the population, were listening on December 8, 1941 when FDR delivered his date, which will live in infamy speech. In addition to its continuing position of dominance, radio played a significant practical role in the war effort in a variety of ways. On the battle lines, the walkie-talkie was a useful new tool for military communication. Outside of the front lines, radio proved fundamental to the promotion of patriotism and citizen responsibility for the war effort. 
including appeals to Americans to purchase war bonds. The most notable of these appeals occurred on February 1, 1944. Other approaches to promoting wartime patriotism involved integrating themes of war into existing programs or creating new programs that focused primarily on the war effort. In so doing, radio helped raise consciousness about rationing. It also contributed to the sense of a shared national cause. In many of these programs, such as This Is War, the producer's aim was to inspire, frighten, and inform all at the same time. Radio news also underwent important qualitative transformations that would have a lasting influence on the way radio and later television informed the population about current events. One such shift was the appearance of live on-site reports. Whereas news coverage had previously consisted of delayed reports read from a broadcasting studio, suddenly Americans could receive information directly from the battle zones. Radio broadcasters gave the details of the unfolding war as it was happening now. It was more urgent and real than any newspaper could provide. Indeed, Murrow's historic coverage of the Nazi bombing raids over London and of the resilience of the British people, signaled a change in how Americans learned about world events. Radio obliterated time and distance in its coverage of World War II in a way that the printed word could not match. This wartime heyday of radio news, however, was not to last. Even though television could build no stations during the war, the young upstart was not standing still. Technical research and innovation continued as Zwarikin developed the image Orthicon to improve light sensitivity, and RCA and CBS experimented with color images. The motion picture industry, like radio, boomed throughout the war. During these years, 23% of Americans' recreational spending went to the movie industry. In the summer of 1946, an article in Variety magazine talked about the film industry's fattest six months in history, during which the box office receipts were $1.7 billion, as 90 million people a week, more than 60% of the population, attended movies. Generally, they went to see double features with a newsreel, sandwiched between features, showing movie images of what Americans were being told through radio. They conveyed the goose-step march of the Nazis and the heroic role of American tanks accompanied by uplifting music and narration. The Japanese Unconditional Surrender, signed on the deck of the battleship Missouri on September 2, 1945, let loose the energy of the American economy to achieve as rapid a reconversion as possible to peacetime production. Although radio initially benefited from this as well, Nothing about peacetime, besides the end of rationing, was more anticipated than the emergence of television. Though it took a few years for the television industry to achieve widespread production and distribution, by 1950, its surge through the nation had begun. The end of World War II signaled the dawn of the golden age of television. Television's Golden Age When the war ended, Privately owned television sets still numbered in the tens of thousands and were located primarily in the New York City area. By 1950, 9% of American households owned a television set, a proportion that had increased to 64.5% only five years later. This increase in percentage ownership by 13 points per year is the fastest diffusion of any appliance or device in history faster than the smartphone after 2003 or the tablet after 2010. By 1955, no less than 97% of households were within reception range of a television signal. Television entered more than 90% of homes by the early 1960s. While said ownership became universal almost overnight, as shown in figure 12-1, the availability of programming particularly in smaller cities, was delayed by the decision in 1948 by the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, temporarily to freeze the granting of television stations. 
The number of television stations was capped until 1952 at a mere 108, and 16 of these were in the three metropolitan areas of New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. In the early years of television, when it was still a rarity in American households, TV watching had a highly social character. For a while, televisions could mainly be found in public places, and the tavern often became the locus where people of the neighborhood would congregate to watch TV. If one's neighbors owned a TV, those neighbors usually became suddenly far more popular, often hosting TV parties. Children would spend hours away from home to take advantage of their neighbor's television set, and maybe even to convince their parents to get one of their own, if only to keep an eye on them. In fact, this was one of the major drivers of television purchases. According to one early study conducted in 1949 of television owners in the New York area, 18% said they had bought a TV set because their children wanted one whereas 15% said they had been watching at friends' houses and now wanted to get one of their own. The most popular reason for buying a set, with about a third of respondents in the study citing it, was to watch sports. During the formative years of commercial television, programming was almost exclusively local. Distinct from the network-dominated nature of the radio age, early television fostered a local presence. Everyone who could access the TV knew the local newscaster and weatherman. Network television arrived as early as 1946, when the first coaxial television cable, connecting New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C., allowed viewers in all three cities to watch the Joe Lewis Billy Kahn heavyweight boxing match. Five years later, AT&T had built a coaxial cable system from coast to coast, that could connect around 95% of American television sets. Thus, the National Television Network was born. Over the next three decades, the networks would wield unparalleled influence in the television business, with 1982 being the first year in which the proportion of network affiliate stations dropped below 80% of the total number of stations. The division of the United States into four time zones immediately created a problem for network executives. Broadcasting an 8 p.m. show in New York simultaneously to Californians at 5 p.m. was impracticable. As a solution, the coaxial cable would bring each network programs instantly to a control center in Los Angeles, where movie cameras were set up to film the programs for rebroadcast three hours later. Those who grew up in the Pacific time zones will remember the fuzziness of the network programs as compared to the much higher quality of the live local TV shows. Only the introduction of the videotape recorder in 1957 allowed Westerners to rejoin the country and enjoy live television programming with the same degree of picture quality as their East Coast brethren. The national networks united the population with the new Window on the World. Ironically, the medium that made the private home the center for recreation also generated a sense of shared public experience. The normal way to enjoy a community experience was at home in your living room at your TV set. On a given day at the office, the most animated topic of conversation at the water cooler likely revolved around the shenanigans that Lucy had gotten into on last night's episode of I Love Lucy. Radio 2 had enjoyed a substantial national presence in its glory days. However, the appeal of television and its characters was stronger. On January 19, 1953, when CBS broadcast the episode of I Love Lucy in which Lucy has a baby to coincide with Lucille Ball actually giving birth, 68.8% of the country's television sets were tuned in. Two years later, Half of the entire population watched as Mary Martin played Peter Pan on television. Also at the top of the ratings was Milton Berle from Texaco Star Theater. Berle's outrageous costumes and slapstick comedy became such a centerpiece of Americans' Tuesday nights that, at least according to one account, sudden drops in Detroit's reservoirs were the result of viewers all waiting until his show was over, then going to the bathroom all at once.
In any case, during one show when Burl ad-libbed saying, listen to your Uncle Milty, he became the nation's uncle. Television was built in part on the back of radio's successes, co-opting funds, broadcasting structures, and stars from the older medium. The instant shift of preferences is measured by surveys of listening and viewing hours. Between 1948 and 1955, average daily radio listening per home fell from 4.4 hours to 2.4 hours. In TV homes, this number was even lower, at 1.9 hours, even as TV viewing in such households averaged 4.9 hours a day. The importance of television to leisure time would continue to grow. And by 2005, the average household spent more than eight hours a day watching television, as is shown in Figure 12-2. Television also affected how people devoted time to social activities. In 1965, television owners spent less time on social activities outside the household, as well as less time sleeping, grooming, gardening, and doing laundry than people without television. By 2005, television, as a primary activity, consumed nearly half of all free time. More than half if television viewing was a secondary or tertiary activity, that is, done at the same time as one or two other more central activities. The impact of television was not limited to shifts in time usage. As a private window to the public world, from the start, television, like radio before it, became a social equalizer. Despite the small picture size and high price of early television sets, by 1960, virtually every household had one. One could enjoy the same programs as anyone else from the comfort of one's own home, free from possible stigma. As one Southern African American stated, it permits us to see things in an uncompromising manner. Ordinarily, to see these things would require that we be segregated and occupy the least desirable seats or vantage point. With television, we're on the level with everyone else. Before television, radio provided the little bit of equality we were able to get. We never wanted to see any show or athletic event bad enough to be segregated in attending it. This is to say nothing of TV's ability to influence public opinion. Perhaps the most famous example of such influence was the first debate in the 1960 presidential campaign between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. During the debate, Nixon, who refused to use makeup, looked haggard and irritated, whereas Kennedy, taking full advantage of the transmitted image, looked sharp, handsome, and engaged in the debate. According to CBS's president at the time, Kennedy was bronzed beautifully. Nixon looked like death. While radio listeners were relatively split on who won, those who watched the debate on television overwhelmingly thought Kennedy was the winner. Kennedy's eventual victory in the election is often attributed to TV's effect on the audience in that first debate. Just as significant was television's role in the civil rights movement. On March 7, 1965, a group of peaceful protesters marching against segregation from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery was attacked by the sheriff of Selma and a band of state troopers. Images of the vicious aggression of the police captured and broadcast to the nation by the television networks inspired a push against such violent bigotry, which soon culminated in Lyndon B. Johnson's signing into law the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The power of the television age wielded political, social, and cultural influence that few other innovations in any sphere could match. And it was hailed as the ultimate communication experience, delivering a dream of spatial transportation that had, since the 19th century, fascinated the modern imagination. It is little wonder, then, that so many predicated that the rise of television would cause the death of print media, radio, and the motion picture. In truth, however, these old media evolved rather than perished, as when Mark Twain cabled from London in 1897, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Old Media in the Television Age 
In the post-war years, movie attendance experienced a precipitous drop. Whereas more than 60% of Americans on average had attended the cinema each week in 1946, by the mid-1950s, attendance was hovering under 25%, a level that has remained fairly stable to this day. See figure 6-5. It is not hard to see how television contributed to this decline. Movie theaters were emptier than they had ever been. Throughout the years, cinemas sought new ways to attract audiences. Technology was one of the main approaches, including 3D films and large formats, including Cinerama. Color, still absent from standard televisions, became far more prevalent in motion pictures, rising from 12% of films in 1947 to 58% in 1954. None of these approaches proved successful. Around the same time the drive-in movie theater arrived, less a response to television than a result of the booming car culture. Though the drive-in theater developed considerable cultural and nostalgic value, it did little to stem the flow of audiences out of theaters, nor did the refurbished megaplexes of the mid-1990s. Yet the motion picture survives. The construction boom of the 1990s demonstrates a stubborn staying power of the movie theater. Although it may not represent a serious rival to TV, the cinema continues to provide a unique large-screen experience that cannot be matched in the living room. This staying power is not always readily apparent in the numbers. After an average of around 500 films released per year in the United States during the 1930s, only 369 were released in 1950, and 232 in 1954. By 1960 and 1970, film releases stabilized at around 200 per year. However, most of the films that disappeared were of B and C grade quality, and they were replaced by big budget blockbusters. There was still room for a critical masterpiece, such as The Godfather, to spur millions of Marlon Brando impersonations, and for Star Wars to burst onto the scene and become a cultural icon and box office success, to this day trailing only Gone with the Wind in inflation-adjusted domestic gross revenue. In 1956, CBS telecast The Wizard of Oz, the first major Hollywood film broadcast on a top television network. A few years later, the film became an annual event on network television, doing more to cement it as a classic than had its time in theaters. By 1975, movies made up more than half of all network primetime programming, as well as 80% of programming on non-affiliated stations. As one writer put it, more people than ever before are seeing Hollywood films, but most of them are not paying Hollywood for the privilege. However, the networks did pay the Hollywood studios rental fees to show the movies. For instance, NBC paid $10 million in 1974 to broadcast a two-night special of The Godfather. The investment paid off, for NBC won the ratings war on those nights. Through TV, the motion picture still wielded considerable cultural and economic influence. Though television virtually eliminated network radio, Local radio stepped in, with advertising for local stations continuing to grow slowly but steadily over the years. Many of these stations made use of a top 40 format, in which a disc jockey played the best-selling records over and over again. In the 1960s, stations became increasingly specialized, some adopting all news formats and others a blend of news, talk, and sports, whereas others settled into musical specialties becoming stations for golden oldies or underground rock, among others. Radio's adaptation to fill the entertainment niches left vacant by television was not limited to programming decisions. The very character of radio listening also was transformed. Because the TV had supplanted the radio as the piece of furniture that brought the family together, radio use took on a more personal dimension. As a teenager and college student, I had a small AM radio and sometimes dialed around at night to find the clear channel radio station that was the farthest away. 
The transistor reduced the cost of radio and enabled people to use pocket-sized radios wherever they went. And there were soon more radios than households. Between 1940 and 1970, the car radio grew from being a feature in 30% of cars to being in 95% of them. In short, radio didn't die. It wasn't even sick. It just had to be psychoanalyzed. The public didn't stop loving radio despite TV. It just started liking it in a different way. And radio went to the beach, to the park, to the patio, and the automobile. Radio has become a companion to the individual instead of remaining a focal point of all family entertainment. An intimacy has developed between radio and the individual. It has become as personal as a pack of cigarettes. In Living Color Changes in Television Quality Though the 1950s were television's golden age, TV still lacked a high-quality picture and real consumer choice. In the next 40 years, four major changes took place that transformed how viewers experienced television. First was the steady improvement of television sets with rates of quality increase that were unprecedented for any consumer product before the arrival of the personal computer. Second was the arrival of color television, coupled with increasing technical mastery over picture definition, which brought more realistic and vibrant images. Third was cable television, which provided innumerable viewing options. And fourth was the VCR, or video cassette recorder, which revolutionized television watching by putting scheduling choices in the hands of the audience, eventually to be replaced by the technically superior digital video recorder, DVR. Figure 12.3 shows the rise in percentage of households reflecting these changes. In Chapter 10, we discovered that refrigerators, washers, clothes dryers, and room air conditioners experienced major quality improvements in the first three decades after the war that share three characteristics. First, the quality changes occurred early in the post-war era and were largely completed by 1970. Second, by far the largest quantitative effect of the improvements came through improved energy efficiency. Third, the cumulative effect of these improvements from 1947 through 1983 was massive. Improvements in quality, that is, previously unmeasured components of consumer surplus that were not included in the GDP data, amounted to 100% of the cost of refrigerators and clothes dryers and 200% of the cost of room air conditioners. The value of quality changes in these appliances pales next to the previously unmeasured quality improvements in TV sets. Over the course of TV's history, sets have become larger, picture quality has improved, and prices have come down. For $350, my parents in 1950 bought a black and white RCA table model with a 9 inch screen, the shape of a pumpkin. Purchase of the set required the additional purchase of a $50 annual service contract. For $418 in current dollars, a customer in August 2014 could purchase a 40-inch high-definition LED color set with theater surround sound and equipped with internet hookups enabling video streaming. The dimensions of improved quality include not just larger and clearer TV pictures, other types of improvements included a radical reduction in weight that made TV sets portable, light enough to carry from room to room. Repair costs, which were estimated at $50 per year in the late 1940s, virtually disappeared after the transition from vacuum tubes to solid-state electronics had been completed by the early 1960s. The arrival of solid-state electronics also created a large gain of energy efficiency. Long forgotten and now taken for granted are early improvements, such as remote control, quartz tuning, stereo speakers, multiple audio and video jacks, and tuners able to handle more than the original 82 VHF UHF channels. My study of the quality of TV sets covered the years 1952 to 83 
and was based on product evaluations from consumer reports and outside evaluations from reliable sources like MIT. In the early years, repair costs were a much larger component of the cost of owning a television set than electricity costs. Between 1950 and 1986, the incidence of repairs for black and white sets was reduced by a factor of 30, and for color sets between 1964 and 1986, by a factor of 10. The Consumer Reports data on the incidence of repairs is among the best of any source of changes in quality, as it is based on the responses of hundreds of thousands of readers who fill in the annual Consumer Reports questionnaire. In contrast to the $50 per year service contracts of 1950, by the 1960s, repair costs had virtually disappeared, and manufacturers were able to offer free repair warranties for a year or longer. Similarly, energy consumption for black and white TV sets fell from 250 watts to 60 watts between 1948 and 1981, whereas consumption for color TV sets fell from 350 watts in 1964 to 110 watts in 1981. When all these dimensions of quality improvement are put together, the true annual rate of price decline for 1952-83 was negative 4.3% per year compared to the price decline of negative 1.0% registered by the CPI. Because CPI data are used to create real GDP, the understatement of the true price decline in the CPI automatically created an equally large understatement of the increase in the growth of the TV component of real GDP. The difference of negative 3.3% per year accumulates over the 31-year time span to 278% implying that the unmeasured consumer surplus provided by developments of the television set in 1983 is almost triple the amount spent on the TV sets themselves. This adjustment is doubtless an understatement, making no allowance for the improvement in picture quality. In a 1950 Consumer Reports evaluation, five of 14 rated sets were labeled poor or unacceptable for their picture quality. By 1967, the evaluation was the opposite. Quote, the top-ranked sets showed clearer, crisper pictures than any we have seen, end quote. By 1984, an author wrote of the latest models that, the first thing you notice is that the picture is sharper, brighter, and more contrasty in broad daylight. The main reason the picture is sharper than in the past is that many of the better sets use a so-called comb filter, which separates the color signal from the black and white signal. Unlike home appliances, white goods, in which there were only minimal quality improvements after 1972, TV sets have continued until the present day rapidly to increase in quality. The transition was particularly significant between 2000 and 2014, with the twin innovations of flat screens and high definition. A basic TV had a 10-inch screen in 1950, a 19-inch screen in 1983, and a 40-inch HD screen in 2014. Thus, screen sizes doubled and doubled again. But in 2014, screen sizes had expanded far beyond 40 inches. For $1,000, one could buy a 60-inch HD set that had 2.2 times the viewing area of a 40-inch set, 10 times the typical viewing area of a 1984 set, and 36 times the viewing area of the typical 1950 set. The quality and picture size of TV sets increased between 1983 and 2014, while their price plummeted. The starting point for a comparison of prices is the average price of $700 for 15 different 1983 19-inch models rated by Consumer Reports. The average price of 19-inch TV sets dropped to $327 in 1992 and $161 in 1999 for an average rate of price change of negative 9.0% per year. 
The price dropped almost as rapidly for 27-inch models, which had an average price in Consumer Reports of $657 in 1992, $423 in 1999, and $321 in 2004. For an average rate of price change of negative 6.0% per year. As time went on, the size of TV set models rated by Consumer Reports continued to increase. The average price of 32 inch models declined from $773 in 1997 to $559 in 2004, a rate of price change of negative 4.6% per year. The rate of price decline increased radically with the introduction of HD plasma and LCD sets, first rated by Consumer Reports in 2003 and 2004. As one example, the average price of 32-inch LCD models decreased from $2,916 in 2005 to $382 in 2014 for an average rate of price change of negative 22.5% per year. Larger plasma and LCD HD sets declined at an even faster rate in the decade ending in 2014. Previously, we have noted the substantial understatement in the rate of price decline by the CPI for television sets in the period 1952 to 83 when the CPI decreased at an annual rate of 3.3% slower than the alternative price index discussed earlier. This understatement continued between 1983 and 1999, when the CPI declined at a rate 4.0% slower than the average price of 19-inch and 27-inch sets, negative 3.8% per year for the CPI as compared to negative 7.8%, for the average prices listed in Consumer Reports. The 4.0% annual rate of price decline cumulates over the 16 years 1983 to 99 to an additional 89% of unmeasured consumer benefit from television sets, and combined with the 278% understatement from 1952 to 1983 amounts to a total understatement for 1952 to 99 of 425%. 2.78 times 1.89 equals 5.25. However, starting in 1998, the methodology of the CPI was changed to introduce a hedonic price index for TV sets, a method that controls for quality change along numerous dimensions including not only picture size and high definition resolution, but additional features as well such as connectivity to the Internet. As a result of this change in methodology, there was virtually no difference between the CPI and the average prices of HD sets obtained from consumer reports in the decade ending in 2014, during which the CPI for TV sets registered a rate of price change of negative 20.4% per year. This is an important example of a theme that runs throughout this book, that the understatement of the consumer surplus provided by new products, the HD television set in this case, has been smaller in recent years than earlier in the post-war era, not to mention during 1870 to 1940. None of these estimates include the value of the transition from black and white to color television, yet that transition was one of the most important events in the history of entertainment. Since the mid-1970s, Color television has become a staple in almost every American household. At the same time, picture definition has continuously improved, with ever higher gradations of resolution until, as of May 2012, more than 70% of households had an HD-capable television set, compared to less than 15% in November 2007. Today, Americans watch the Rose Bowl Parade on a large flat screen with a colorful brilliance and crisp clarity that could have only been dreamed of when color TV first arrived 60 years ago. Another major change in the TV audience's experience was the advent of cable television, which began as a device to improve TV reception in distant locations. A few men independently seeking ways to bring a clear picture to their own homes located in small, isolated towns, 
found a simple but effective solution. They erected antenna towers where landmarks could not obscure the signal, and then ran connecting wires to their television sets. Soon they were providing cable services to their own and neighboring towns for a subscription cost of around two or three dollars a month. Cable television maintained its small scale local character until the 1960s, when viewer demand for sports programming brought it into conversations about national entertainment. Even then, however, cable faced obstacles. At first, the FCC, concerned about questions of broadcasting piracy on the part of cable providers, heavily regulated the expansion of CATV. In the 1980s, however, cable television would finally have its day, as the consolidation of cable providers enabled them to overcome initial investment and installation costs. From 1980 to 1990, the percentage of TV households with wired cable almost tripled, from 20 to 56. Unlike early CATV, the main benefits of a cable subscription lay in variety. Viewers' options extended far beyond the three networks and a smattering of local channels. People could now watch a station devoted entirely to music videos, or, if they were willing to pay extra for premium cable, could see movies on HBO, free from advertising interruption, 24 hours a day. This expansion of viewing options spelled the end of the network's dominance. The percentage of stations that were network affiliates dropped below 80 in 1982 for the first time since 1947. Only five years later, this proportion was down to 60.7%. Moreover, between 1986 and 1999, the network's audience share was cut in half to less than 30%. While networks still received, on the whole, more viewers than the smaller, newer stations, the days when a single show such as I Love Lucy or Texaco Star Theater represented a universally shared experience were gone. Cable 2, however, lost its edge for satisfying the consumer. Despite increasing competition from satellite TV, cable providers raised prices at three times the rate of inflation between 1998 and 2003 after an FCC decision to deregulate prices. Moreover, the cable services industry has consistently received some of the lowest marks in customer satisfaction. As satellite continued to establish its place in the television market, and as digital entertainment has started to establish a foothold, cable subscriptions dropped from nearly two-thirds of American households in 2000 to just under 52% of homes by 2010. Another major development in television was the video cassette recorder, VCR. Entering American markets in the late 70s, the videotape recorder allowed its owners to record their favorite programs, to watch whenever it best suited them. In what has been called time shifting, for the first time the viewer, not the broadcasting station, now had control over when TV was watched. With a little delay, the VCR was purchased by most American families, whereas just over 1% of homes were equipped with VCR in 1980. It had reached 68.6% .6 of households by 1990 and 81% by 1995. In fact, the popularity of VCRs was so great that the value of VCR shipments exceeded that of washing machines by 1983. A partial cause of this growth was the VCR's rapid price reductions, from $1,200 in 1978 to less than $250 by 1987. This rate of price decline of 17% per year exceeded that of any other appliance, albeit for only nine years. And this rate greatly understates the true rate of price decline, because quality change was very rapid in the first few years. The earliest models had electromechanical switches rather than electronic controls and these were a constant cause of repair incidents as the controls were prone to jamming. The earliest models also lacked any programming capability and even lacked a remote control. By 1982, super deluxe VCRs arrived that were initially very expensive, but quickly declined in price. 
These included infrared remote control, 14-day programming capability, and multiple recording heads. Because the VCR was not introduced into the CPI until 1987, all of this gain in consumer surplus resulting from the falling price and greatly improved quality was entirely missed in the GDP statistics. Another reason for the popularity of the VCR, beyond its time-shifting capabilities, was the pre-recorded video business. Not only could viewers decide when they watched TV programming, but also they could choose to watch Hollywood films in their homes that were not scheduled for TV. Because purchasing such pre-recorded tapes could cost up to $80, rentals became the typical means for watching these videos, a convention that persisted up until the videotape was overtaken by the DVD player and DVR recorder, as discussed hereafter. Transitions in Music During the first three decades of the post-war era, the phonograph was still king. During the war and in the immediate years that followed, the 78 RPM record remained the best way, outside of a live radio performance, to listen to music. The 78 had plenty of problems, though, with poor sound quality and short playing time that necessitated the constant use of record changes, even to hear just one classical song. The war, however, spurred a revolution in sound that solved these problems. In 1948, Columbia introduced the 33 and a third RPM disc, a record that brought long playing capabilities to its listeners. The idea of the LP was not new. Thomas Edison had, in fact, produced a record in 1926 with around 40 minutes of reproduction, although it had been highly unreliable and low quality. The new 33 and a third differed from records of the past in its use of vinyl. As opposed to the 78's blend of shellac and various filler substances, vinyl was a highly durable and unbreakable material. The change lengthened the record's average life and enabled producers to cut much finer grooves into the record, which both improved sound quality and increased the possible number of revolutions and thus the playing time of the disc. This was the birth of the album as Americans could now sit and listen to a disc that played up to a half hour per side with very high quality. RCA, just months after Columbia's release of the LP, released the 45 RPM record. Despite using vinyl microgroove technology, the 45 brought higher quality sound than the 78, but not long playing capabilities. While the 33 and a third introduced the concept of the album, the 45, as a single, was less expensive and gained its following with youth audiences as it became the vehicle for rock and roll. For a time, the 45 RPM record was the ultimate adolescent artifact. It was cheap as an allowance and easily transportable. It set just the right tempo for Saturday night. For a couple of American generations, a stack of 45s on a chubby spindle evokes a time of sweaty hands and quickened heartbeats, blue lights in the basement rec room. Of course, the 45 itself bore witness to the idea that nothing is forever. It distilled transitory teenage romance into three-minute segments. In the past, music recordings of an artist followed fame. In these years, the 45 was the maker of fame. It made the stars of the day and influenced the stars of the future. The magnetic tape recorder, another recording innovation to come out of World War II, took some time before it made its full impact. Though the sound was not of the highest quality, it offered longer recording time and could be edited easily, unlike the phonograph disc, which relied on recording a song once through. Thus, artists could double track the vocals to harmonize and strengthen the sound of their singing voice or delete and tape over mistakes. Though the tape recorder received limited use during the 1950s, mainly by independent artists such as Chuck Berry, or to archive bebop from jazz clubs, the introduction of the tape cassette in the 60s signaled its true entrance into the spotlight. The tape cassette was user-friendly, compact and portable, 
and it was capable of playing 45 minutes of music per side of tape. Sound quality and playing time continued to improve over the following decades. The tape cassette democratized music. People who lacked the resources to record in the studio now had an avenue to make music and sell it commercially, as happened with the emergence of rap music in the late 1980s. The consumer could become the producer, and the varieties of music expanded as independent recording became more predictable. In addition to providing more diverse and participatory music options, the cassette tape made it easier to access one's favorite music. One could listen to a full album of one's choice while driving a car to work, an option not available with even the new and improved phonograph-based record discs. The emergence of the portable Walkman, a precursor to today's iPod, allowed people to take music with them wherever they went. As one Walkman user noted, it's totally liberating. At the push of a button, you can be somewhere else with your music. It would be the compact disc, however, that received the most accolades, for it was able to respond to the problems of both the record disc and the tape cassette. Using a laser instead of microgrooves, the CD could play longer than either, up to 75 minutes on a single disc. The user also had the option of randomizing the order of songs. Perhaps most important, the CD recreated and even improved on the sound quality of vinyl records as cassette tapes could not, while still being an accessible, portable option. From 1978 to 88, the sale of vinyl records fell 80%, a result more of the cassette tape than the CD, which was not introduced until 1982. By 1988, CD sales outpaced those of vinyl records, and by 1991, they overtook cassette tapes as well. The CD reached its peak in 2002, when it accounted for more than 95% of sales, a number that would decrease quickly thanks to the iPod and digital music downloading, to be discussed later. From World War II until the end of the 20th century, the way Americans listened to music changed in significant ways. Though the phonograph was the main source of recorded music for the first 30 years, thanks to the vinyl microgroove record, the cassette tape and then the CD ruled the final portion of the century, largely because of their mobility. Music was not, however, the only sphere of life in which mobility had become a paramount characteristic. Can you hear me now? The Expansion and Mobilization of Telecommunications in 1940, the telephone had still reached only about 40% of American homes. Prices remained high, especially for long-distance calls. Such calls had to be patched through by an operator, or several operators, using a manual switchboard. As subscribers increased in number, so too did the number of possible connections at the square of the number of subscribers. This exponential growth meant that the number of operators and size of the switchboards themselves had to keep expanding, unless the process could be streamlined. The first automatic toll switch, located in Philadelphia in 1943, allowed a single operator, rather than a team of operators, to connect users to a long-distance phone number, though the operator still had to dial up to 19 digits. The real breakthrough came in 1951, when AT&T introduced direct distance dialing. In the new system, a caller could forego the operator by dialing 10 digits, the first three of which represented a unique area code for a particular part of the country. The initial area codes all required that the middle digit be zero or one, and the largest metropolitan areas were recognized by the low digits of their area codes. New York was 212, Washington 202, Los Angeles 213, and Chicago 312. The first call of this system, between Mayor Leslie Downing in Inglewood, New Jersey, and Mayor Frank Osborne in Alameda, California, on November 10, 1951, took only 18 seconds to connect from coast to coast. Just 36 years earlier, the first transcontinental phone call between New York and California had taken more than 23 minutes for five different operators to connect. 
Barriers of time and distance on the telephone were beginning to fade away. Before the end of the decade, around 80% of the country's telephones could be reached by 60% of subscribers through direct dialing. However, there were still issues of switching capacity that made long-distance phone calls unreliable and inaccessible to many. In large cities, switchboards were overloaded, whereas in rural areas, they were costly and inefficient. The solution was to convert to automatic dialing of all telephone calls. The breakthrough toward such automation had come in 1948 with the invention of the transistor, which would also prove integral to the development of the computer. The transistor, invented by Walter Bratton, John Bardeen, and a team of Bell Lab scientists, facilitated electronic design and circuitry. This development quickly directed many experts to work on applying electronics to telecommunications switching, and in 1960, the Stored Program Control System, one of the earliest electronic switching systems, was applied commercially in Morris, Illinois. By the 1970s, AT&T's Traffic Service Position System essentially brought a national standard of automation to telephony. Compatible with nearly all Bell System local and toll switching systems, TSPS eliminated the need for an operator in many tedious tasks, such as collecting tolls. Meanwhile, nearly all subscribers could reach one another through direct distance dialing. The efficiency gains from automation improved simultaneity, convenience, and cost of telephone calls by reducing the need for intermediate operators. These developments helped reduce the price of a three-minute phone call from New York to San Francisco from more than $75 in 1939 to about $3 in 1981. In the same time, rates from New York to London fell from more than $240 to just under $6. As a result of rate reductions and accompanying growth in subscriptions over this period, the average number of daily toll calls per capita rose more than 11 times. Moreover, by 1990, 93% of American families had a telephone, compared to 40% 50 years earlier. Just as the residential landline telephone was establishing a firm foothold in nearly every American household, the cellular phone was introduced. Mobile phones had been around for some time, but they had to remain within close range of a transmitting station. In the 1970s, a cellular system consisting of a network of receiving and transmitting towers, or cells, began to be established. As a cellular phone moved, its signal switched to the nearest cell. In the early days, car phones dominated the cellular industry, largely because portable handheld phones were too bulky and heavy to carry around. The Motorola 8000 introduced in 1984 was often compared to a brick. By 1988, only 5% of cellular phone sales in the United States were of hand portables. Moreover, the cell phone was still mainly a tool for business, and calls were generally short and to the point. Films such as Wall Street, 1987, presented cell phones as a symbol of status and financial success. Only toward the end of the 1990s did the cell phone begin to affect the life of the average American. With the number of subscribers growing from just over 5 million in 1990, or about 2% of the population, to nearly 110 million, or 39% of Americans, by the year 2000. During that time, the number of cell sites increased proportionally, and the average monthly bill decreased by nearly half. After 2000, the cell phone overtook the residential telephone as the standard means of telecommunication. Whereas the residential telephone accounted for 75% of American phone surface expenditures in 2001, this percentage was down to 37.3 by 2009. In 2010, there were almost 2.6 cell phones for every household. And by 2013, 91% of American adults had one, as can be seen in figure 12-4. As shown in that figure, Americans increasingly canceled their landline service as they came to rely entirely on mobile phone communication.
The explosion of the cellular phone into American life changed many social and cultural practices. For the first time, where are you could be used outside of a game of hide and seek, as the telephone number was no longer limited to one location. Parents were always just a few button dials away from hearing their child's voice, which probably came as a comfort to them. Though the ever-present proximity of parental voices was considered a decrease in the standard of living by many a college student, one of its biggest effects was on the planning of social gatherings. By the time I got my first phone, its purchase was not so much a fashion statement or the result of any love of shiny new technology as it was a necessity. If I wanted a social life, then I had better get my hands on one. My friends had long dispersed with the traditional method of arranging nights out well in advance, establishing firm details, such as where and precisely when we would meet. Instead, a vague indication of plans would be finalized at the last minute, coordinated in real time through texts and quick calls. I got a phone because I did not want to be left out. The cell phone has its drawbacks such as the intrusion of someone else's phone conversation into one's personal space. With the advent of the smartphone, to be discussed in the next section, one often sees a table full of people at a restaurant, each with their eyes glued to their own small screen as they send text messages. People instinctively check their phones every 10 minutes, never free from their self-imposed obligation constantly to scan the latest updates on their social networks. Yet the cell phone has provided freedom for spontaneity, an increased sense of security, and an end to being out of touch. The news. Immediacy also came to characterize Americans' consumption of news. The early years of television news were experimental works in progress. When TV news programs showed footage, they did so often days or weeks after the fact and taken from newsreel clips because television cameras still had trouble producing a good picture outside of studios. As time went on, television news became more substantive and produced more of its own film footage. The improvement in television quality was accompanied by a corresponding decline in the cinema newsreel, which was all but dead by the mid-1960s. Television news, on the other hand, increasingly gained a quality and credibility that the newsreel lacked. The information came first from a familiar anchor, with footage used for the most part as a substantive complement rather than purely as an eye-catching distraction. Indeed, the familiarity of the network anchors helped television news surpass not only the newsreel, but also the newspaper as the main source of news. For example, Walter Cronkite, with his wholesome manner and appearance, his studied fairness, his twinkle in the midst of seriousness, was deeply trusted by millions when he was the anchor of the CBS Evening News. He was even mentioned as a suitable candidate for vice president. The effect of TV news went beyond the ability to present a familiar, trusted face to deliver the top stories. Like radio, television news was immediate but it also wielded the power of the image to evoke strong feelings in the viewer. In addition to coverage of the day's top stories, television news also developed more in-depth journalistic programs. The news documentary reached new heights in 1968 with the introduction of CBS's 60 Minutes. Still, after 47 years, one of the top highest-rated network TV programs week after week. Cable television delivered CNN as the first 24-hour news station in 1980. By the 1990s, so many channels were available that one could choose to listen to political talk from the left, MSNBC, Center, CNN, or right, Fox News, of the political spectrum. In the largest metropolitan areas, there was even a 24-hour local cable channel. For example, NY1 in the New York area and CLTV in Chicago. Unsurprisingly, after reaching all-time highs in the post-war years, newspaper circulation per household soon began a gradual but continuous decline, dropping from 1.4 per household in 1949 to 0.8 in 
in 1980 and to less than 0.4 in 2010. See figure 12.5. The newspaper's quantitative decline was accompanied by qualitative changes. Before radio and TV delivered an immediacy of reporting that the papers could not match, newspapers were essentially bulletins for the most recent developments off the wire. They provided bare facts of what was happening in the world, with little analysis or interpretation, although those facts were often determined by a certain fast and loose devil-may-care attitude, because the incentive was to be the first to print the newest scoop. With television, newspapers had no chance of reporting the biggest stories first. To compete, papers endeavored to provide more comprehensive coverage or to uncover special interest stories that had not reached the TV broadcasts. Rather than printing the news and leaving it for the reader to decipher the meaning, newspapers began integrating analysis into their stories. The success of the weekly news magazines, such as Time and Newsweek, which distilled often complicated events of the week into orderly, easily understood synopses for the reader, spurred imitation from the newspapers. Moreover, TV made sports so popular that by the 1980s, many newspapers devoted around 20% of their news space to a separate sports section. Thus, though newspapers were unable to halt their steady decline, they did carve out a niche in spaces that television could not fill. By the late 1990s, both television and the newspapers faced a new competitor, news delivered over the Internet. Google searches allowed any specific piece of news, such as a stock price quotation or a sports score, to be located immediately. A brief bulletin heard on the radio could be fleshed out by reading a longer story obtained through Google. Between 2003 and 2012, even as ad revenues for online newspaper editions nearly tripled, overall revenues were cut in half. For the print editions were losing advertisers more quickly than online editions could make up for lost revenue. Though television remains Americans' primary source for news, with more than 87% of respondents in a 2014 poll saying they had used it for news in the past week, 69% were now using laptops and computers as well. The large majority of smartphone and tablet owners use such devices for news. Meanwhile, radio provided 65% of Americans with news while newspapers reached 61% of the adult population. As TV news is able to relate current events so that viewers feel a part of current events, Internet news provides the benefits of up-to-the-minute, convenient, personalized content. Blogs and chat groups have further diverted attention from traditional media. However, neither venue for news is without its flaws. Because of the power of the image, Events of visual impact often supersede issues of more substantive importance, such as the economy's weak labor market or political gridlock in Washington. With Internet news, studies have found that reading speed and retention are lower when people use a digital screen, raising questions of how beneficial is the current transition toward digital news. Digital Media the personalization and fragmentation of entertainment. A theme throughout this chapter is that unlike for some other aspects of the standard of living discussed in other chapters, there has been no slowing in the rate of progress of entertainment and communication. The move toward digital media began in the 1990s, and the transformation accelerated through the past 15 years. From music to movies to television, Entertainment has increasingly shifted to digital devices and in many ways transformed its own social meaning. In music, the first step toward digitalization was the MP3 in the late 90s, a high-compression file that could be downloaded onto computers and play music. File sharing whereby people would rip music from a CD into MP3 form and then distribute music files to others for free made music more accessible than before because of the large quantity of music that could be stored on a small portable device. 
When it was introduced in 2001, the iPod separated itself from the pack of MP3 players with its intuitive click wheel interface and its compatibility with iTunes. In turn, iTunes integrated the market for digital music and one's own personal music library into a single user-friendly computer application. One could choose one of thousands of songs from the pocket-sized device, and for the first time, the user had almost total control over the listening experience. The iPod replaced the portable CD player, for a user's library of CD albums could be uploaded into the iTunes program at zero cost. Suddenly a choice among hundreds of albums, limited only by the size of one's existing CD collection, could be heard and sorted by song or artist. More MP3 songs and albums could be purchased for reasonable prices from the iTunes store. Though the iPod was the most influential driver of the shift to digital music and has maintained its favored position, it has been joined by several other innovative sources of music. The websites Pandora and Spotify have taken the radio format to the internet and personalized it, streaming music according to the listener's stated preferences. For instance, Spotify allows users unlimited access to its entire library of 30 million songs for a monthly subscription of around $10, or for free, if one is willing to listen to advertisements. These changes in music delivery not only increased the portable capacity and convenience of acquiring and listening to music, but also made music listening highly personal. Wherever one has access to the internet, one can listen to favorite songs or do any of millions never heard before. The shift toward digital audiovisual entertainment evolved in stages. The prominence of the VCR met its demise on two fronts in the late 1990s and early 2000s. The DVD, or digital video disc, was introduced to the United States in 1995, and by 2006, more American households had a DVD player, 81.2%, then a VCR player, 79.2%. A lighter and more compact device than the video cassette, DVDs also provided higher definition and expanded capabilities, such as menu selections and skipping scenes. By 2011, nearly 87% of households owned DVD players. This transition is summarized in Table 12.1. On the other front, the DVR or digital video recorder, emerged at the turn of the century to challenge the VCR as the principal time-shifting device. While the VCR created a revolution in how people watched TV, the DVR's main contribution was to improve the convenience of time-shifting, as recording became as simple as clicking a button on the remote. All recordings were located in one place without taking up the space of tens or hundreds of videotapes. Though less than half of American households had a DVR in October 2013, on average, about 30 minutes per day was spent watching time-shifted TV. Another important development has been the emergence of online video streaming. From video sharing on YouTube, to the copious movie and television offerings on Netflix, the number of viewing options has exploded, with people in full control of when, where, and what they watch. With more than 30 million subscribers in 2014 to a streaming service that had only begun in 2007, Netflix has led the way as audiovisual entertainment has found its new home on the Internet. Before its success in video streaming, Netflix pioneered the business of renting DVD movies by mail, and within a few years drove the retail rental giant blockbuster into bankruptcy and liquidation. Like the coming of television, the move toward digital entertainment dominance has not pushed aside the old audiovisual media. Rather, just as the motion picture shifted and adapted to changing circumstances in the second half of the 20th century, TV and movies have done the same in the digital age. At first, seen as a threat by the movie industry, DVDs became a cash cow and even caused Hollywood to increase movie production and variety 
to fill store shelves with DVDs. Sites such as Netflix have the potential to do the same. Digitalization has also affected the written word. Though around 70% of adults read a book in print in 2013, the proportion of those who read an e-book was up to 28% from just 17% two years earlier. Though e-readers, such as the Kindle, started the shift toward digital books, the tablet has become popular as a device well-suited for reading. The advent of the smartphone, beginning with the BlackBerry and continuing with the iPhone, made entertainment mobile in the same way the earlier cell phones had made communications mobile. In January 2014, 58% of American adults owned a smartphone, an impressive number, considering that the first smartphone, the BlackBerry, entered U.S. markets in 2003. With a smartphone, one could listen to music, send text messages and emails, watch sports highlights, or read a magazine article on one device, all while waiting in line at the supermarket. We carried a first or second generation mobile phone because communication was desirable, even essential, on the move. But we are now carrying around a new object, one that might trick us into thinking that it is merely an extended phone, but is, in fact, I think, a radically new personal device. The smartphone is not just a phone. It's a computer, and computers are unique. They are, in a crucial respect, unlike any other technology, and uniquely important in the history of the modern world. Indeed, for some people, the smartphone's auxiliary functions have superseded typical phone uses. Of the 63% of adult cell owners who used their phones to go online as of May 2013, 34% used the phone as their primary means of accessing the Internet, and 81% sent or received text messages. Around half of cell phone owners, and presumably the large majority of smartphone owners, accessed email listened to music, downloaded applications, and used GPS capabilities. One of the main developments unique to the smartphone was the application or app. Introduced in 2008, the Apple iPhone App Store has rapidly expanded its offerings from 500 initial apps to more than 700,000. Ranging from games to portals for social networks or new publications, Apps have seen more than 30 billion downloads. The smartphone and its Twitter app have been largely responsible for the success of that social networking company, as 78% of the approximately 60 million monthly active users in the United States access it using mobile phones. Conclusion Of all the components of the American standard of living, the quality of entertainment and communications advanced fastest and farthest throughout the 1940 to 2014 era. There has been no post-1970 slowdown in the pace of progress, such as occurred for food, clothing, household appliances, and air travel. Technologies that have become integral parts of the American household were unknown, or at most distant dreams in 1940. Today, however, the TV introduced by David Sarnoff at the 1939 World Fair can be found in nearly every home and is used by more than 88% of adults each day. In fact, the majority of homes have more than one TV, through which they can be transported to any part of the world, to a highly anticipated sporting event, or through which they can view a recent movie without commercials, through mail movie rental or video streaming. The initial benefits of television were followed by a sequence of further innovations, large and small. The quality of television sets steadily improved so much that for the same price of roughly $400, the repair-prone 9-inch black-and-white set of 1950 has been replaced in 2014 by a dazzling 40-inch LED high-definition color set with surround stereo sound. For most of the post-war period, the enormous improvement in the quality of TV sets relative to their price was understated by the CPI, the official government price index. 
Between 1952 and 1999, we estimate that for every dollar of spending on TV sets recorded in real GDP, quality improvements have delivered $5 of unmeasured benefits. Since 1999, improved CPI methodology has eliminated this source of price index understatement of consumer benefits. The radical declines in the price of HD television sets by a factor of 10 between 2004 and 2014 have been accurately tracked by the CPI, which declined by a rate of more than 20% per year during that decade. This provides an example of a theme of this book, that the extent of understatement of the benefits of new and improved products has been less significant than in the earlier post-war years, and particularly before World War II. The transition to color by 1970 brought new life and reality to the television screen, and cable expanded viewers' options, providing a plethora of narrow-interest alternatives to the broad-based appeal of the networks. Starting in the late 1970s, the VCR, and later the DVR, put full-time shifting control into the hands of audience members, allowing them to watch at times that fit their schedule. Such choice and control were unprecedented. At no time in history has one been able to decide at a moment's notice to watch an opera, a baseball game, or a myriad of other program types. Platforms for listening to music went through several phases of transformation. Although the phonograph continued to dominate the music scene for three decades after the 1940s, from the 1970s on, new technologies made music mobile. The portability of music listening devices, from transistor radios to the Walkman and the iPod, was matched by an ever-expanding storage capacity and playing time. In communications, the price of long-distance calls declined steadily until today phone users take for granted that all long-distance domestic calls, even across 3,000 miles of distance, are covered by a fixed-price phone plan. Mobile phones continue this trend by erasing constraints not only of distance, but also of location. A spontaneous phone call from wherever one happens to be is taken for granted today. Whereas 70 years ago, a connection between two locations could take several minutes and cost as much or more than the hourly wage. In the past two decades, digitalization has brought convenience and personalization throughout the world of entertainment and communication. Please subscribe and press the bell icon to never miss another update. Please like, share, and comment.